We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Just want to welcome everybody here. My name is Pastor Mac. I serve as one of the executive pastors, uh, specifically over operations. So I have the wonderful responsibility of ensuring that this beautiful campus, this building and the finances is all ready to go on a weekly basis here. And so, uh, but before I get started, I do have one quick announcement. So if you, it's NFL season. So anytime a brand new stadium opens up, you have everybody who goes inside. They get everybody to go into the bathrooms and they do what? They flush. Why? Because they want to make sure that their piping, their infrastructure can handle thousands upon thousands of people. All right. A bad analogy to lead into this. Um, I just put in new access points. If you have discarded our Wi-Fi over the last two years, I don't blame you because it didn't work. And so just this last week, we replaced all access points around the building. So what I'd love for you to do, because I need to know if it works, is for everybody to join our guest Wi-Fi. There's the, the, the name and then the password, super simple. Don't let me know today, but at some point, just let somebody know, let me know on whether or not it's working. As it, because I need to make sure that the Wi-Fi will handle. Ah, I got a thumbs up over there. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. All right, so go ahead and get on there because I need to make sure everybody has got Wi-Fi. Um, so we have been in our Catalyst series called Movers and Shakers, and we've been talking about this for the last four weeks. And so we've been trying to explain what a mover and a shaker is, and that's someone who is willing to do what it takes to get something done. And Jesus, he calls each and one of us to be a mover and a shaker in our faith because that is the call on how we are to live our lives differently. And if we can jump right in here, starting with Romans 12, 2, that talks about do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, perfect, and pleasing will. And then you also have in 1 Peter 3.15, says, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Being sold out to Jesus, believe it or not, as the world wants you to believe, is not a weakness. It's honestly, it's a force not to be reckoned with. And so for the last four weeks, that is what we have been trying to tell you guys, is that if any of you guys have read the book, it starts with why by Simon Sinek. He has something called the golden circle. And what's phenomenal about this is if you worked for Apple and somebody came up and said, hey, why do you work for Apple? They more likely will say, well, because uh, we sell amazing computers. Well, no, that's, that's, that's what you do. That's not why you work for Apple. And so for the church, we have our own why. Why is it that we exist? Why is it that I get out of bed every single morning? And our why is to see people transformed and released by the love of Jesus. That's why we are here. How do we do it? We do it by loving God, loving people, and serving our community, just like we did yesterday with our big go day. So we went over... Uh, so that's how we do it. What we do is our five catalysts, which we've gone over the last several weeks. We worship regularly. We connect relationally. We grow personally. Pastor Matt last week talked about serve sacrificially. And today we conclude 
our Mover and Shaker series with Give Generously. Um, and I love the way that we have our catalysts ordered because it's obviously, it's not alphabetically, and it's how we, and it's not always the case, but it's typically how somebody comes to faith. And it was certainly true in my life. And so if you pay attention to the catalyst phrase on there, when we talk about worshiping regularly, that's again, it's realizing that it is so important on a regular basis to get in here and worship with other believers in here. It's saying, hey, it's raining outside, so maybe I'll just watch online or not even at all. It's saying, you know what, it doesn't matter what is going on. I see the importance and the value of coming into the house of the Lord to worship with other believers. Connecting relationally. All right, we talked some weeks ago, that's our life groups. We are a church of life groups. We, I believe, have 40 groups now, but our participation, getting people into the group, is still at a low level, in our opinion. And so it's recognizing that the way we do life with one another is by doing life with one another. And so Pastor Matt has said, if there's ever an opportunity where you had to miss a Sunday or miss a life group and you had to choose, choose your life group. Because that is where life happens. When you are at your low, you're going to have brothers and sisters coming around you, lifting you up, encouraging you, and getting you through what it is that you're going through. And then we also have uh, Grow Personally. We offer a number of different grow courses here, which take you in depth into God's Word. Uh, It's another thing that we say around here. We would love if everybody came into a Sunday morning already full because you have been in the Word of God. You have worshipped. You have uh, done your own Bible reading, whatever the case may be, that when you come in here, you're not relying any beyond the stage here to fill you up. And if anything, when we talk, it's just an overflow. And so you're not realizing, or you're not leaning on the fact of the only way you're going to get fed is if you come on a Sunday morning. Serve sacrificially, you know, it's that making that sacrifice, that commitment and saying, you know what, I'm willing to say I can give up another to be able to come serve the Glenbury community, which happened again yesterday. And then, of course, then today we're going to talk about give generously and what does that mean. And so knowing that we all have to start somewhere, we utilize these catalysts to propel movement toward discipleship. And discipleship simply meaning someone who learns to live or learns about Jesus so that they can end up living like him. And so these five catalysts will help to highlight what your next steps may be as you engage in the life of the church and you mature in your faith. So before I get too far into this, let me go ahead and pray. Father, we are just so humbled and honored that you've brought us into this place, a place that we know that we can freely come without any type of persecution, Father, that we have the freedom to worship you, uh, to honor you, to love you, to to sing to you, Father. Uh, We're grateful for this time that you have given us. And so I just ask, Father, that uh, through today's message, Father, that you allow me to, to step back, Father, so that you are able to speak through me, Father, on what it is that you would love us to hear about what it means to give generously. And so, Father, we are so grateful for your son, Jesus Christ, and we pray this in his name. Amen. So what I would love to do is preface, before I get too far into this, that I am not judging anybody in this room. Um, when I was come writing this message, I was convicted in a number of different ways, especially with the verses that I felt like the Lord was putting on my heart to share. And so as I'm writing this and I'm reading this, I'm having to pray because I have to ask myself, where do you stand when it comes to giving generously to the church? Um, And so understand that with some of these scriptures, I believe that they're pretty convicting. Uh, If anything, you have in Hebrews where sometimes we need to spur one another on towards love and good works. That that spurring, think of like a cowboy with spurs on its boots. When it hits the hind side of a horse, it's pricking the horse um, so it can get it to move in that direction. And so I've had to pierce myself um, in understanding what God is trying to, to communicate here. Um, and because certainly I have lived my life 
what it looks like to not give to the church when I was a part of a church and to live on the other side of what it looks like when I do give to the church and what my life looks like because they're two vastly different ways of living and I think on how God ultimately blesses that. Um, and so the first scripture I want to show for you guys, and it should be on the screen there, is from James 1, through 24. But it says, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in the mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. And what I, even I, have to constantly, all right, I love this word. But there are some things in Scripture it's like, ah, I don't know. But what we have to understand is this Bible, God's word, is either 100% true or it's 100% false. And you can't be in between. Revelations 3, 15, 16, Jesus, speaking to the Laodicean church, says, I know all the things you do. You are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I, this is Jesus talking, will spit you out of my mouth. Because there is no sitting on the fence here. We all need to determine what we believe and ask God to continually grow us in our faith and in our relationship with him. And there's this beautiful passage in the book of Matthew, which is the first book of the New Testament. And Matthew was one of Jesus' disciples, an eyewitness to everything Jesus did and said. And in Matthew 7, 24 through 27, and this is from the NIV, says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And when the rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine, and does not put them into practice, is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. And the rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. And with all said With all that said and all this understanding, we as Christians are supposed to be more than just hearers of the word. We need to be able to put this into practice. So today, all right, and everyone here was pretty much left without an excuse because we've told you what our catalysts are. And so by everybody in the room, I'm assuming everybody's as excited as I am to talk about money in the church, all right? It's one of those things that, for whatever reason, is almost a taboo word in the church, and it shouldn't be. Um, And one of the reasons is it was talked about often is from Jesus in the Gospels. Now, I'm not one that will say that I believe that Jesus taught more about anything else in the Bible. Um, But what I will say is that he did talk about it often. Uh, There are times in some of the parables that he may illustrate or use money as an example, but that wasn't the principle. That wasn't the focus of that, uh, of that uh, parable. And so there are some good life lessons using money as an illustration and showing us where our priorities truly lie. But either way, Jesus talks about money, and it's important that we, and including me, need to have the same understanding that God has for his church in giving back to him. So I want to focus today's message on answering some questions using Malachi 3 um, as our guide. And if you're not familiar with Malachi, it's the very last book in the Old Testament. So if you are in Matthew, just flip over one book to your left. We're back into the Old Testament, and we're now in Malachi 3. And there's only four chapters, and so we'll be in verse 3, or excuse me, chapter 3. Now Malachi was mostly an anonymous prophet whose ministry occurred in Jerusalem during the era of Nehemiah and Ezra. And although he spoke primarily to a specific time and place in history, Malachi also prophesied of Jesus as far as the forerunner, which is John the Baptist, 
who had announced the appearance of Christ more than 400 years after his lifetime. So Malachi, which is famously known for the only time in Scripture where God says, test me in this, in bringing your tithes to the storehouse, and he will bless you. So if you have your Bibles open or your smartphones, uh, go ahead and come to Malachi 3, and we're going to read 6 through 12. It'll certainly be on the screen behind me. And what I love, if you're using the NLT version of this, what I love about this is that the header to this is a call to repentance. And so what that word repentant means, it's literally you're going in one direction, knowing that you are outside of God's will, you're sinning, you're doing something you're not supposed to be doing, and then you repent, excuse me, repent, and you turn like literally 180 degrees, you turn in the other direction to stop doing it, to get yourself back into God's will. And so I love that it's called a call to repentance, because if you had the new King James Version, this same section is called robbing God. And that was a question I asked is, how is it possible to rob God? So when we read this section of scripture here, anytime you see the word cheated, I want you to also replace it with the word robbed. All right, so in verse six, it says, and I love how this starts, I am the Lord and I do not change. This is why you, descendants of Jacob, are not already destroyed. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them. Now return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of the heaven's armies. But you ask, how can we return when we have never gone away? Should people cheat God or rob? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? You have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. You are a, under a curse, for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, so that there will be enough food in my temple. And if you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open up the window of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great that you won't have enough room to take it in. Try me. Put me to the test. Your crops will be abundant, for I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for your land will be such a delight, says the Lord of the heaven's armies. In a section of scripture about tithing, this verse, this section of verses starts off with, I am the Lord and I do not change. This God that we serve now is the same God that we see in the Old Testament. And so let's start with a topic that even Christians are divided in the New Testament. And that first question is, do tithing principles even apply to us today? And it's a fair question, because it gets asked a lot. And there are Christians, and I certainly used to believe that once Christ died, once he died and he rose again, that through the new covenant, through his resurrection, that we're not a part of the Old Testament anymore. Like those practices and laws, we don't have to do those things anymore. But then you go back to Malachi 3, 6, And says, I am the Lord, and I do not change. Even in the very next chapter, verse, excuse me, in chapter 4, verse 4, remember to obey the law of Moses, my servant. All the decrees and regulations that I gave him on Mount Sinai for all Israel. This is so important because knowing that after Malachi, there was about 400 years all right, before we get to the book of Matthew, that if God didn't want us to follow, or there's no way he would have put that at the very end of the Old Testament. Now, I somewhat humorous find that here we have tithing talked about in the very last book of the New, Old Testament, and then when you move into the New Testament, how often do you hear about tithing? Like, how often do you see that word tithing come up in the New Testament? 
Because I, I can count it on one hand, and truthfully, I could probably count it on one finger, the amount of times that it's mentioned in there. And so it's kind of humorous in the sense of if tithing was so important, God, what would have saved everybody an argument is if you just would have put it one more book to the right. Like before the book of Matthew, in the book of Matthew, just one book separates a massive confusion amongst even us Christians. And so in Matthew 5, 17 through 19, here we find in the New Testament, Jesus talking about the law. And he says, don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. Well, what about in in 2 Corinthians 9? Doesn't Paul, he doesn't talk about tithings. Like he talks about, you know, decide what you have in your heart on what you're to give and give cheerfully because God loves a cheerful giver. And that's true that he doesn't. But tithing, when we're talking about in this context, in the Old and even the New Testament, tithing was one of those things that was common. Like, it was something they did. It's not something that they had to be reminded of over and over again. It's just they knew that a tithe meant 10%, mostly at the time of animals and crops and such. But they knew that it was 10%. Um, So in 2 Corinthians 8, Paul was telling the church in Corinth about the generosity of the Macedonian churches. Now, what's so unique and special, and you'll have to go back and read 2 Corinthians 8 about the generosity of this church, of the Macedonian church, and it was actually about three other churches that made up the Macedonian churches. And what was so special about that is despite their severe poverty, despite their level of persecution happening to those churches, that they continually put themselves into the Lord first. They gave themselves to the Lord first, and nothing, they were so in love with Jesus, his ministry, they were so in love with Paul and his uh, his teachers and being able to reach out to other churches. They were trying to support uh, Jerusalem with their needs and their persecution and their poverty as well that despite having nothing, the Macedonian churches, not only did they tithe, but they also gave over and abundant to be able to provide for whatever those needs are. And that's something that I certainly hope and can only pray for, that if I'm ever in that situation, or if this church is ever in that situation, despite anything that may be going on, whether it's a a severe economic crisis or severe persecution, whatever it is, that we may be able to realize that just because that's happening doesn't mean it's the end. It's not the end until Jesus comes back, right? It's, we have a job as Christians. And so one of the things is we had that big go day yesterday. And Pastor John was talking about how Betty Jo was a benefit of that. She attended it yesterday and then all of a sudden, or excuse me, a year ago, and then came back and actually served this one. So I have no doubt that we may have some other guests in this room here. And certainly for our guests, the first message you want to hear from visiting the church the first time is why we should give. So let me say this. If you're a guest in this church, all right, all we want from you is just to be able to receive what the Word of God says. Um, If you're not a Christian, all right, you haven't accepted Jesus Christ, but you're coming here. We love that fact. But you're excused for the rest of this message. All right, I'm not asking you to tone me out, but I am just saying this is not applicable to you. Who I'm talking to right now are all those in this room that profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Um, so if you want to receive the blessings of God, then you need to sow abundantly so that you reap abundantly. The less you sow, the less you reap. So in 2 Corinthians 9, when Paul's talking about uh, using the illustration of uh, somebody planting seeds, well, if I'm going to plant something and I only throw a few seeds in there, then I should only expect I'm only going to get a few things to produce. But if I sow abundantly, well, then I should know that I'm going to receive abundantly on here. So in some sense, if you want to receive the blessings of God, then you need to be able to sow abundantly. And Jesus... Here's another question. He didn't talk about tithing, so tithing isn't a a thing anymore, right? 
Well, if you go to Matthew 23, 23, and since it's football season, and I can, you guys understand the term goat, right? The, the, the greatest of all time, all right? Dallas Cowboys? No? No? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, this verse, Matthew 23, 23, is probably the goat verse when it comes to tithing in the New Testament. And this is Jesus, all right? His red letters. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, faith. Here we go. You should tithe, yes, but that's not the most important thing. Do not neglect the more important things. And so, again, these are the red letters of Jesus. So if there's anything you disagree or want to argue about, take it up with Jesus and not me, all right? The Pharisees were so focused on staying true to the law by tithing that they completely neglected the more important things, meaning they paid attention to the minor rules that made a little difference to others while neglecting the primary ways they were supposed to act towards others, which is to bless them. So technically, yes, they were obeying, but they are missing the more important things. And so there was a sermon I watched about giving, giving and his name is Pastor, Pep, uh, Pastor Kelly Kay. Um, and I follow him on TikTok, and one quote I'm going to put on the screen here, if there's anything I want you to remember today, it's probably this quote here. And he says, obedience without submission is worthless. It's worthless. In obedience, you can do the right thing because it's the right thing to do and have a sorry attitude about it. Here's my tithe, whatever. Or, oh, I really don't want to go to church today, but yeah, I probably ought to go, so I'm going to go to church today. If that was the heart and the motivation of why we came here and gave or even attended church, I have no doubt that God would say, keep whatever it is that you're going to give. I don't even need it. I have no doubt. But submission, on the other hand, it's an honor to do this. Yeah, I'm going to obey, but it's because I want to. Because it's not about the act. It's not about the thing being asked to do. It's, I love you, God, so much that I am going to do whatever it is you ask. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it no matter what the cost. So another question that typically gets asked, is tithing actually talking about money? And the answer to that, the short answer is yes. Yes, it is. Because I would guess that 99.999% of us in this room are not herding sheep, aren't harvesting grain fields, herbs, all right? Majority, if not all of us, receive a paycheck nowadays. And some people ask, well, what about my times and talents? There are some who will say, instead of giving money to the church, they tithe their time by serving. And I would say that I disagree with that because the tithe we read about in the Bible, ultimately, especially the New Testament, was for the Levite priests, and their work in taking care of the temple because they weren't allowed to purchase or own fields or grow things. So much like this church who has staff who work in the church nowadays, they are the caretakers of God's house and take care of the people that are within it. And so plus, when you're talking about I tithe my time, do you guys know how many hours are in a work week or in a seven-day week? It's 168 hours a week. I would be curious and would love to have a conversation on how, from a tithing standpoint, you are serving or giving 16.8 hours to the church every week amongst everything else that we have going on in our lives. So when people talk about tithe to the church in the form of time, like I said, I don't think they're getting that 16.8 concept. So what we read, if we continue on in that same scripture in Malachi 3 in verse 8, when God says to the people of Israel, you have cheated me, all right, robbed me of the tithes and offerings due to me. And you see that tithes and offerings are to 
different things. Tithe, as we said, is 10%. That is of your income. And first and foremost, that is the very basic thing that any one of us who are believers in Jesus Christ, who believe that this is live and active today, this is the very basic thing that any one of us should be doing. And so a frequent tax question I get a lot is whether or not I should be tithing off the gross, which is before taxes, or should I be tithing on the net, which is after the taxes? For me, the way me and my family do it is, who do you see comes first? God or our government? And so for me, I choose God. He is going to get the best. He is going to get the first of whatever I have, and then the government can take their stuff, and then, you know, save, hopefully, and be able to live on the rest there. And so, um, so to be fair with the before and after taxes, I can't pull a specific... Uh, book, chapter, verse on where to find that in there. Um, we can certainly have differences of opinion on that, and we're still going to love each other and do ministry. It's one of those things you call a non-negotiable um, or negotiable thing. And so when it comes to offerings, all right, this is where we see it's different. This is what you give to God after you've given your tithe. This is where your offering doesn't always have to be financial. It certainly can be, for those of you who are tithing to this church, we just had our vision night a couple weeks ago. And so when people were filling out those cards, that would be considered like an offering. It was also a step of, hey, if you're not tithing yet, this is an invitation for you to start tithing or to at least get on the track to where you can start giving something. But those of you who are already tithe, that would be considered like an offering. It could be anything. It could, this is where it could be your time in the church you know, if you're already tithing and now you're serving sacrificially upstairs or on the parking lot, cafe, wherever in this church, that's when your time can become an offering. If you want to donate a vehicle or supplies to the church, again, after your tithe, that would be an offering. And here's the thing is you don't have to give your offering to your home church. In offering, if you've got another nonprofit, some other charity that you love and respect and believe in their mission, after your tithe, that's where your offering can come from. Feel free to give to those charities that you support. And so when we move to verse 9, it says that you're robbing, you're cheating God of our tithes and our offerings. Doing so, you're under a curse, which does not mean that he is cursing you. What he's saying is the world, all right, for Christians, the world, all right, full of other non-believers, you are already living in a cursed world. And so what ends up happening when you don't bring the tithes and the offerings to the storehouse, what God is saying at that point is you are intentionally walking out from God's umbrella of blessings for you, that he has in store for you in his life. And so you see in that next verse to test me on this, because God wants to bless you so much. He wants to bless you so bad that he wants you to try him on this. Do we not pray for certain things and hope that God answers those prayers as a blessing? Whether it's in this time, you're looking for another job, or you need another job, or um, you've got the, um, you know, maybe you're asking for a raise, or maybe there's a number of different things that um, we ask for God, and we hope that he answers those things. And so when we come to God, but then we don't give back to God, this is what we steal from God when we don't bring the tithe. And as Christians, this is something at a minimum that we should be doing. And so now, just kind of a sidetrack, now I understand why, from a lead pastor standpoint, on why it is so hard <laughs> to talk on this subject here, because there are so many challenging truths, again, that I'm asking myself here. It's like, all right, uh, so I feel for any lead guy who typically does these types of giving talks on here. Um, but the bottom line is, what I don't want you to hear or think is that if you don't tithe, that God's going to hurt you or curse you. Malachi is saying we already live in a cursed world. God is our father, all right? He's not our 
Godfather. All right, you feel me from that movie with, I don't know if it's Al Pacino. All right, he's not saying, come bring the ties or I'm going to curse you. That's a horrible, horrible, <laughs> I'm not an actor. So anyway, you may, be think, you may think because you're already receiving a blessing of God that you're, and, and you're not tithing. Why should I start tithing? Like, if I'm not tithing and God, I feel like God's already blessing me, then why should I start? Well, because you're his children, and he loves you. So, yes, he is going to extend some blessings to you. Just because you and I, and I have three girls right now that are, they can be disobedient as just any other kids that you have out there. Um, and just because they're disobe- disobedient doesn't mean that I love my children any less. Now, what it does mean is come Christmas time. There's one who could certainly receive more than the other. And I say that on camera in hopes that they probably won't, but watch this one day and see that how they need to act. But the bottom line is, I can promise you the blessings between my obedient and disobedient children are going to be vastly different. And but regardless of that, God is still going to bless you. And so If you were to tithe and bring your tithes to the storehouse with your offerings, imagine the additional blessings that's going to be bestowed upon you. Now, this is not, let me be clear, some prosperity gospel of you do this, God's going to give you this sort of thing. That's not what I'm saying at all. Blessings can come in all different kinds of forms, whether it is financial, answered prayers, whatever the case may be. But this is definitely not a, hey, if you start giving your money to church, God's all of a sudden going to fill your bank account up. All right? And that's, that's not what I'm saying at all. So, does the tithe, and the last question is, does the tithe have to go to the church that we attend? And when I say attend, I mean your home church here. And Malachi 3.10 says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so that there will be enough food in my temple. So whose house is this? This is God's house in here. So we bring our tithes into the storehouse. God did not say, bring your tithe into the storehouse if the worship was good today. He does not say, bring your tithe into the storehouse if that preacher was on fire today. There are people who do, and not just ACC, but all across, that regularly attend one church, but feel like they get fed at another church, and that's where they tithe over there. I dare you to go over to Outback tip, but not pay your bill because you say, I'm going to walk over to Mission Barbecue because that's my favorite restaurant, and I'm going to pay it over there. That's not going to work. I promise you it won't work. So the same thing applies to our church. Just like in a restaurant, it does not matter who is serving you because regardless You're going to that restaurant because it's your favorite, and you understand that this meal, this word of God, is going to be good. I didn't get that. Could you try again? Siri. (laughs) She is on Do Not Disturb, but anyway. um, My bad. So... (laughs) I don't even know how it sounded remotely. Hey, Siri. Um, But, oh gosh, here she goes again on my iPad. (laughs) Sorry, guys. (laughs) All right, so let me get back on track. Back on track. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Um, Your tithe comes here, all right? Your tithe comes here because that is what you're supporting. You're not supporting a person. You're not supporting this building or this establishment. It's your tithe going to the house of the Lord, because this is what he says. Now, in regards to your offering, give, it, give whatever you want. You can fund my mission barbecue addiction if you like, all right? Maybe, no? All right. So, in all honesty, it's giving your offering to any charity that you want. You can give it to the homeless. You can put it wherever you want. But bottom line is, if this is where you get fed, If this is where you come to get meals from God, this is where your tithe goes. If it is where you come to worship God, this is where your tithe goes. So living a Christian life is realizing that God wants to do nothing more than to bless you and for you to live a life reflective of his son, Jesus Christ. It may seem like this is some quid pro quo, do this and you get this. And it's not like that at all. 
when God can see what we can be trusted with, with what he has given us, the blessings will only increase. It may not always be in the form of extra cash, but in the areas in which you pray, it will be answered. It could be in forms of others helping you when you least expect it. I have certainly had my fair share of where's rent money going to come from, or I've had broken transmissions, and where's that extra money going to come from? But God has certainly blessed the people in my life to be able to say, I got you. So, what do we do with all this? We always end every message with a three-word prayer, what now, God? The first thing I would say is pray. Pray because I may oversee the finances of this church, but the tithes and offerings are between you and God. And the bottom line is, you are accountable to God. And will you continue to rob God of his blessings for you. Pray on that. The other thing you can do is take him at his word as we just read. Test him in this. We have something called the ACC Giving Challenge. We have done this giving challenge for since 2014. And hundreds have taken this challenge. And not one person has come back and said, that God didn't do what he said he would do. And so the challenge is this. For the next 90 days, you say, God, I'm going to give you my full tithe, and I'm going to do so over the next 90 days. And if, for whatever reason, you believe that God has not done what he said he would do, that he would not bless you, you come talk to me. Not Pastor Matt, not any of the other pastors. You come to me. And if you feel like, again, that God has not done what he said he's going to do, I'm going to write you a check for everything that you gave to ACC, no questions asked. And since 2014, we have had not one person come back and say, God has not ever said, he blessed me in the ways that I expected him to. The last thing is understand our catalysts and what they're for. What is your next step? If you're someone who's not coming as regular as you feel like you should be coming, Make that your next step. Make that a priority. No matter what it is that you're going through, if you're hurting, if you're facing uh, some kind of hardship, if it's raining outside, if the ravens are playing at one o'clock home and you want to go tailgating, we've got an E15 service, all right? Make worship a priority. Connecting relationally, that's our life groups. That is almost the heartbeat of the church. Again, we would almost rather you be in a life group than on a Sunday morning because that is where life happens with the people that are around you. If you're in the hospital, it's wonderful that we get contact at the church so we can visit, but your first response ought to be, who am I doing life with? Because as this church grows, we have to find ways to get smaller, and that happens through life groups. Growing personally, we offer a ton of different growth courses in this to help you learn to absorb more, to understand what God may be trying to teach you. We offer all of those types of classes. We have a new discipleship track that's going on right now for people who are committing and wanting to say, I want to be a disciple of Jesus and I want to know what that means. Serving sacrificially. Maybe you're not serving anywhere in this church. I'm going to do a little selfish plug for my wife here, who's the Jess at the children's director. She needs kids. Or no, she doesn't need kids. <laughs> she needs you. She needs your help. Two weeks ago, we had 212 kids upstairs. Two weeks ago. Do you know what it was? Yeah, celebrate that. Do you know what it was last Sunday? 211. We need help. We need teachers. And so... If you love kids, whether it's nursery or working with elementary or preschool age kids, mark it on your Connect card. Say, yes, I want to get plugged in. We need help everywhere else too. Um, But all over the place. Um, The harvest is plentiful. Scripture. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. All right? And giving generously, just as we talked about today. All right? Pray to God and see where it is that you are with him and what it is if you are living in his will or outside of his will for the blessings that he wants to give you. 
So go ahead and please pray with me. Father, we are just, again, so humbled and honored that you have us here and that we are able to, with freedom, Father, open up your word and to be able to talk about it. And knowing that this word uh, from thousands upon years ago to even today, Father, is still the same. That it's alive and it's an active, Father. It's something that you speak to us every single day if we are willing to open it up and seek you with all of our heart, Father. And so I understand, Father, that this topic can be sensitive. And the church should have no business telling me how to do X, Y, and Z with my finances, Father. And that's not what any of this is about, Father. It's about pointing to you and your word and what is it that you are communicating, Father, so that we can live the way that you designed us to live, so that we can experience, Father, the blessings that you have for each and every one of us. So as we leave here today, Father, I ask that you protect each and every one of us. And we love you so much, Father, and we're grateful for your son, Jesus Christ, that you gave us your son, Father. I think the least we can do, Father, for giving us your only son so that we may have eternity with you is to give back in a way with all the things that you've entrusted us with, Father. We thank you for this time and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.